This is back to back. Yo, what's up, back to backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. This is Back to Back. This is my podcast. You know, I hope you feel like this is your podcast too. That's the idea. But to be specific, it's my podcast. That being said, it's nothing without you out there. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having a good day. I hope you had a good week. Hard to believe it's September already. But look, I'm going to keep the intro short this week. I think a lot of people are going to be excited for this episode. I've got Sudden Death on the show. One of the rising stars of dubstep right now. He's having a huge year. You know, he just debuted the live show for his Void project. We're going to talk a lot more about that, but people are just going crazy over this live show. The Void 1.5 EP, he just dropped that too, with a lot of remixes from some of the big biggest names in the game. And right now he's on some dates for the Alchemy Tour out there with the former guest of the show Nightmare, former guest of the show The Glitch Mob, and a bunch more crazy tour. So go grab the music, the dates, all of that. There's a link in the description of this episode. You know how this works. I'll tell you a little more about this convo in just a second. But first, as always, I got to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Serato. You know, I was just actually reading an email from Serato, and it reminded me, I think one thing that sets them apart, other than just being a legendary company in the game, their customer service is so good and it's really noticeable how they take care of the people who use their products. But what I want to tell you is that Serato has released a great piece of software called Serato Studio. For all my producers out there, this one is for you because Serato Studio is a great little piece of beat making software. They've used all their expertise talking to DJs in the live world to really figure out what a DJ wants out of a piece of software. It's fast it's intuitive, it's really fun to use, and Serato Studio comes with a lot of loops, plugins, effects, a ton of content to get you started, to get you making noise right away. It's all built in. And right now, if you go to www.serato.com slash studio, you can download the fully featured trial free for 14 days. So shout out to Serato. Go check them out. Grab Serato Studio. That's www.serato.com slash studio. So for this chat with Sudden Death, we met up uh, actually in Baltimore. He was out there playing at the Moonrise Festival. And we had this chat in a hotel room uh, really high up overlooking the waterfront. It's actually a gorgeous view. The sun was setting. Uh, his manager, Clint, was also there, who I've known for a long time. And by the time we finished up, I think everyone was really excited about the conversation we had just had. You know, dubstep is one of those weird genres where it's hugely popular all across the country, probably better now by the numbers than it's ever been. I mean, it's just huge. But I think unless you're in that scene, you wouldn't even know it. And so it's always cool for me to be able to give a little bit more serious attention to sounds and styles and artists that I think sometimes get overlooked by media outlets or the mainstream in general, which is not to say that I'm a media outlet or the mainstream. But to me, something that means so much to so many people deserves just as much consideration and attention as anything else. And especially a guy like Sudden Death, man, he's on the rise. So much excitement about what he's doing right now. The sounds that he's pushing, the ideas that he's trying out, I think it really is evolving the sound of dubstep, which was kind of needed right now. And we talk about that in the conversation. Uh, like I said earlier, he's got the Void project as well. And overall, he was just super fun to talk to. I had a great time doing it. I think he did too. I liked how much he was really emphasizing the community aspect of the scene, shouting out tons of other producers. 
up and coming names. You could tell he really gets it. And actually, right before I hit record on this, uh, I was just randomly scrolling Twitter and I saw a post of his that was bigging up the LGBTQ scene, just throwing out a shout out and a reminder to everybody that really none of this music, none of these scenes would be here without queer culture without minority culture. Love seeing that from somebody in his position. You know, again, if you've listened to the show before, you know I talk about that all the time. All this shit I love to talk about, he's about it. He's on fire right now with his music. Great time to talk to him and just a great time in general. So don't forget the links to all his music, the tour dates, everything. That's going to be in the description of this episode. And when you're done, if you like what I'm doing over here at Back to Back, the best way to support is to let other people know that you're listening. Word of mouth is how we grow over here. And none of this would be possible without the support of awesome listeners like you. Every time I see somebody tagging me in their stories, tweeting about the show. All of that helps me keep growing this, making it bigger, getting more and more guests for you every single week. So keep it up. I'm always going to be chatting with anybody I see out there who's tagging us, talking about us. My name is at Willie Joy on all social media, or you can hit me up at Back to Back Pod. And if you've got any questions for me, anything that's been on your mind, any thoughts about the show, I always love that too. Back to Back Pod at gmail.com is the email email address. So if you're hearing my voice right now, much love to you and let's get into today's episode. This is me and Sudden Death back to back. Let's go. Check, check. Can you you hear me in there? Oh yeah. Yeah. Say something again. Uh, Weenies, 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 weenies. Very good. That's great. So you just got back from Moonrise. How was it? How was the set? It was crazy, man. All the kids were going off, uh, mosh pitting, and um, you know there was a healthy amount of violence. Uh, yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> Define healthy. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, like when it's aggressive music, you really have to take it out on your homie. That's all it is. I grew up in metal bands and all that. Word. And yeah, it's it's sort of a funny recurring theme, especially with like bass music and especially with dubstep. Like mm. I feel like almost everybody has that metal background somewhere in there. Yeah, definitely. Is that true for you too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I was in like some really bad metal bands when I was younger, and but like mostly I was just interested in the. Uh, in like the whole scene itself and like I go to shows when I was a kid and like uh, that and like punk shows like my first show I ever went to my dad took me to it was uh, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys it was his 50th birthday oh shit and uh, it was him who played and then also like the Melvins and uh, yeah it was a cool time that's a great first show <laughs> yeah I think I was like 12 or something <laughs> like that uh, your manager, Clint, is sitting right over there. Yeah, he's bald. Hey. <laughs> Classic. Let's just get that Got out him. there at the top. <laughs> One thing I noticed, uh, I was looking at the, the set times over there at Moonrise when I knew I was coming to talk to you, and uh, something I thought was interesting was right after you, Rusko was playing, right? Yeah. I want you to talk a little bit about a moment like that, because I have to imagine a figure like Rusko, who you know more or less like brought dubstep, exploded it in the States to go from like a fan to a peer, you know what I mean? Mm. And probably someone you saw when you were just starting off as like kind of this like rock star guy. Yeah. And now you're just playing next to each other at a stage. Like what, what is that like? It's really crazy, man. Like Resco is for sure the person who got me into dubstep. Is that right? Um, I mean, like I'd heard some dubstep songs before, but it was when I heard Jehovah by Resco that I was like, whoa, I really like this kind of music. And like all of his albums that came after that really, really piqued my interest. And like, you know, through him, I found like Casper and there's also like Scream and stuff like that. Yeah, but like, Benga and all those guys. Yeah, yeah. So like that was like back in like 2008, 2009, some, somewhere around that time. The reason why I started like going to like shows in general, you know, because mm-hmm. I wanted to hear that kind of music live. But how, how old were you when you went to that first show ever, Jello Biafra? Oh, I think I was like 12. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, so you you get into heavier music, mm-hmm. punk music, aggressive music. And did you, were you playing instruments at the time? 
Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like I grew up. You know, my parents like were really, really encouraging of me doing music. Uh, when I was a kid, I learned how to play the piano, like you know most kids do. Yeah. But um, I also got into like playing guitar and also did like bass guitar. Like that was like the main instrument that I ended up playing. Um, the reason for that was because. Uh, I joined marching bands when I was like 14. Yeah. And I actually didn't really want to do it. Uh, my mom was like, you should do this. And I was like, okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, you don't have as much wiggle room when you're 14. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad that she did because I played in the pit ensemble. I was like learning guitar around that time. So it was like, I probably started playing guitar when I was like 13 or something like that. They were like, we need a, an electric bassist for the pit. I was like, oh, I know how to play guitar, kind of. And so they just like put me in there. Right. It was actually like overall like a miserable experience. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was pretty bad. But um, why, why you just not into the music or like bad oh, teachers? Oh, absolutely or, not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, my band teachers are pretty cool. Like, um, like I talked to them a lot, but the whole like marching band experience was pretty bad. But I, it was a really good learning experience because I got to learn like all the like, percussion ensemble stuff like mm. you know learning how to play drums and kind of trial by fire a little bit yeah yeah that's cool man it, what uh god damn it clint, clint dude jeez <laughs> just <laughs> just <laughs> i'm just kidding it's all good what kind of a kid were you in those days like if if the marching band wasn't really your oh, i was your a coward scene. <laughs> what do you mean yeah i was a cowardly kid <laughs> Yeah. Just in general, yeah. Very. I don't want to say like introverted, but just more like uh, like socially inept mm. and uh, you like know. scared to try new things. Kind yeah, of? I mean, like granted, like you know, I got um, when I was like fourteen. I came from like a school that the whole it wasn't like a private school; it was still a public school. Yeah, but the graduating class, the you know eighth grade, was like thirty kids, and so like oh, I wow. only knew like a grand total of like ninety kids in my whole life, and then I went to high school, which had like. You know, like two thousand yeah. people in my grade, or something like that, or maybe I don't know. I might be exaggerating that number. Well, but maybe it felt like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe like five hundred. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Well, that I mean, that'd be intimidating for anyone. Mm. Uh, what did your parents do? Um, my dad's a software engineer, and my mom is a teacher. Okay. Yeah. That's cool, man. I my dad is a software engineer, and my mom is a doctor, so it's nice. not too far off. And you grew up in San Jose, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know San Jose that well. Like I've been there, I've played shows there, mm. but as a kid growing up, what what was that like? Was it a cool place to grow up? Um, it was like really. It was pretty nice. Um, there's not really much going on over there. Yeah. Uh, really close to F SF. Which is nice because um, I mean, you have the old rest of the Bay Area, like yeah. Oakland and stuff. Would you get out there a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, like especially when I was like uh, once I was in high school and yeah, stuff. Yeah, old enough to drive and yeah, yeah, all of that. Because I mean, before the tech boom, like San Jose was sort of kind. Was it just dead? Was it kind of hood? Um, My impression was like before the tech boom, it wasn't the nicest place. I think during the tech boom, I mean, like you had like East Palo Alto and like, you know, Oakland, it yeah. was all pretty like fucked up. And the majority of the time that I grew up over there, it was like, you know, you had like some areas that were like pretty shitty. Cause like, you know, Oakland was like the murder capital of the world for a while. Right. I mean, every time that I've been there, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, like, granted, I've been robbed and fucking, you know, shot at like a bunch. Oh, is that like, right? Gro like, going to Oakland and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's like a cool place, like, in general. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you ignore that stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's funny, man. I mean, everywhere in the Bay, shout out the Bay. And it's all, like, that's the fucking place. Oh, I mean, I yeah. love the Bay Area. I'm not talking shit about it at all. But uh, yeah, San Jose, especially, I just, I feel, I felt like I could never, like, get the character of it. You know what I mean? Mm. So, you know, going through high school then, and, and you said you heard Russ go and like started hearing electronic music around like 17, something mm. like that. How did you hear it first? Um, well, I mean, like I've always loved electronic music. Like growing up, it's been a huge part of the music that I listen to. I mean, like what came first? Like what was, can you remember sort of the first electronic um, sounds you heard? I don't really know the first. I mean, like my, if Okay, if I really trace it back, like all the way back, probably it would be like my dad showing me like craft work or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Right. And so, like, you know, I thought they were cool. Um, but I mean, like, once I started finding more like dance artists, like, I really love Dead Mouse. Yeah. Like, 
like I first heard about him, I like always like dreamed of like going to like raves and stuff like that. Mm, I mean, but, I think he's responsible for getting a lot of people into electronic music. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Like whatever else anyone wants to say about him, the effect he's had on this culture is so huge. Mm. Did you kind of right away hear it and want to be involved with it, or did you start off more as just like a listener, a fan of it? Definitely more of a fan because, like, in my head, I wanted to go to the shows, but like. I, the only things I knew how to do was play like instruments, right? So I was like, oh man, like I want to like cover this Daft Punk song or like uh, like listen to Justice and like I want to like play their stuff on a guitar or bass or something like that and like make weird sound design stuff um, using like instruments because it just didn't make sense to me mm. how they made it. You were just trying to figure out how they made it with the tools you had. More yeah, or less. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I understood that like you know you use like. Uh, like software, or like synths or something like that, and like various other hardware to like make it. Um, but I didn't understand that the majority of them were using. Uh, well, actually, back then a lot of them were using, you know, a lot of hardware and stuff. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I, I understood kind of what was going on, but like I, I just wanted to copy it in a way because like I thought that it could be cool to do it with like instruments, and then I realized how far off I was from doing anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how yeah. did you realize like you were trying to make some early attempts? Well, that and also like me like being in bands and stuff, like no one really fucked with that kind of stuff at all. Like they thought electronic music was stupid. Mm. You know, like I'd show them stuff and they're like, yo, this is this is whack, dude. Right. Like, you know. It's not metal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, how did it evolve for you then? You know, leaving high school, uh, did you go to college? Kinda. Yeah. So I went to San Francisco State University for one year. Um, and then I dropped out because during that year I just, I discovered Ableton. You're right. And, um, I was like, why, like, I literally hate school. Like, why am I here? (laughs) This doesn't make sense. And also I'm going to be like in massive debt and I don't like anything that Mm. I'm doing here. Did you go there kind of just because that's what was expected? Like that was just the path to follow at the time? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like the next thing you do after high school. I mean, like I didn't know when I graduated high school that I, like in the the back of my head, I always wanted to be a musician, but like figuring out how to do that. I mean, like I I still don't know how to do that. You know what I mean? Like can't really make that decision. Once I figured out how to use Ableton, I was like, I'm, there's no way I'm doing anything else. Like this is the only thing that makes sense to me. Hmm. Yeah. Was it, was it that the software just made sense to you or was it that excitement of you finally figured out how to access those sounds that you couldn't make before? Probably a combo of both. I had tried using FL, uh, cause like I was friends with like a producer who was like a bit older, usually like 35 and like he let me and my friends use the studio space to record and he would like, and he gave me FL studio, like FL seven or something like that. Yeah. And I tried learning it and it really just was not intuitive to me. Like the old ver- older versions of FL, like even the current ones, like it confused me a lot. Like I still use FL now, okay. but like using Ableton is like way, way, way more user friendly and intuitive yeah. and stuff. So. Yeah, I mean I'm on Ableton. That's yeah. but it's interesting to me that you also what do you use FL for now? FL has a lot of really crazy sound design, like native plugins and stuff. Sure. So, for example, like I use FL for like the granulizer, or you know, it has Vocodex, and like it's hard to re- recreate like those things on other things. Like even because I use a Mac too, so right. like I can't. I think I think you can get Vocodex for Mac now, but oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, like you can get standalone FL plugins, like right. some of them, like Harmer, I think. Yeah, but some of them are exclusive to Windows, and yeah, so I just like resample stuff. That's cool, man. I I feel like, it, and tell me if you agree or not, but I feel like that maybe is one of the reasons why I think your sound stands out a lot from a lot of other people's, because I I think almost every producer kind of gets locked into sort of one DAW or the other, and that. It really does shape anybody's sound, you know. Oh, absolutely, right. So, do you do you work in uh, other programs as well? Yeah, like, I use Reason. Okay, um, I use Reason a lot for mm. sound design because the Maelstrom they are crazy. Yeah, Maelstrom is a like granular based synth, right? So the way that it sounds, it sounds so real, you know, because all of it's based off of like actual audio. I'm pretty sure, right? And yeah, it's just it's so sick, like. There's no way to recreate. Well, I mean, you can kind of recreate it, but like getting like that gritty feeling of reason 
Like yeah. it, I think is necessary for a lot of like really evil stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I like that, man. And I've said this on the show a bunch of times, but I mean, a lot of my favorite producers come from Reason, you mm-hmm. know, some of the most distinctive, Absolutely. like sounding people mm-hmm. either are still on Reason or they started there and like really carved out a sound with that. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said too, right? For just learning a tool that not everybody uses. Would you agree? I feel like that's a way to sort of make yourself stand out. Absolutely. I feel like as you know, you get more comfortable doing things as a producer, you will start to do the same thing over and over and over again if you don't really attempt to change your whole process. So mm-hmm. like using and utilizing the actual infinite amount of tools that you have that are on the internet, you can get free stuff. Like yeah. it's way more wise, especially for sound design. I mean, like you can literally if you could think of anything that has to do with audio and try and recreate it. I mean, like I use my own voice for sound design, you know, mm. but you know, it's just like doing the most random stuff and trying to switch it up so you don't make the same thing over and over. Do you worry about that? Do you are you conscious of like, oh, I'm getting too comfortable in this one, you know? sound or this one synth or I've used this a lot mm-hmm. like do you try to actively sort of absolutely make Every, yourself uncomfortable a little bit mm-hmm. I like especially I mean I've always tried to do it but this year especially I'm just like I'm really trying to never do the same thing twice mm. you know you can get kind of caught up in that where it's like oh this isn't original or like maybe it sounds like shit <laughs> right. you know so it's like how do you figure out how to do things and not spread yourself too thin but still learn and make things that sound original right mm. But I mean, that's the problem. You know, that's <laughs> right. why things get stagnated. Right. Well, how do you do that? And, and still, you know, stay prolific? Because now you're touring all the time. You're a known name. You're a known entity. So now there's sort of that expectation from outside, right? To keep music coming out, to keep just keep on the road, whatever it is. How do you still, have you found out a way to kind of balance like learning new things and trying new things with still getting the work done? No. <laughs> um, but there's ways to like kind of like tiptoe around that, you know? I mean like and try and keep yourself fresh like trying to find new plugins and trying to do things on synths that you really just would not think. I, I don't know, it's just whatever comes to your head, even if it it comes from like literally physically doing something that's different. Like the synth that I use the most is Operator, which is Ableton's native yeah. FM synth. Shout out to Operator. Yeah. And that's like my favorite synth, and I'm really, really competent in using that. And I can probably make the majority of like FM based synths within like a like ten seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. because I'm so comfortable with that. Yeah. But I think you just blew a lot of people's minds with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I mean, like you know, like I've always used Serum and Massive. Like, right. I suck at Massive. Like I, it's hard for me to get a good sound. At, well, honestly, like I've learned a lot about sound design, especially in the last year. I think I've gotten a lot more capable than I was before. Mm. But it still it comes down to what synth you know the best and how fast can you do something and how do you try something that sounds new, like. Right, right off the bat. Is that fun for you? Is that a process you enjoy? I like it. figuring out a new yeah. part, a new tool. Mm-hmm. Have you always been that way? Like if you were, you know, trying a bunch of different instruments too, like was that always just kind of the way your brain worked? Was, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I love trying to learn new instruments. Like uh, it's my favorite thing to like find new things and learn how to play them and make them sound good. I know a lot of instruments, but don't know how to play them well. Right. But I can on a very, very basic level, play the vast majority of instruments. Like I know how to do it. Mm. But um, you know, also I write a song that was good. No. No, right. no way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not but, a fucking genius, man. Yeah. Well, sure. But I think that attitude is is super healthy and probably very helpful to everything you're doing, right? It's just to, you know, try something out if it doesn't work, try the next thing and and not because I think a lot of people it doing that would just get discouraged, you know? I think a lot I think it's maybe the more common way is to just learn the one thing until you're comfortable, like super comfortable, right? Yeah. And then there's like this, uh, this like cost of your time to like start a new thing, right? Yeah, And cost absolutely. of energy and all that. But that's cool, man. I, I like hearing that that can kind of energize you. I think uh, something that's important in music is being able to be like a jack of all trades in a lot of different aspects. Because that way, I mean like, when you listen to music, you want to take inspiration from everything that 
anyone's ever done. You know, I yeah. mean, like there's infinite music out there. There's, uh, you know, so many different sounds and stuff you've never heard before. Like no one's like, and stuff you would never think, you know, that's why other people do music. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the same sense that you want to listen to music, you want to try and experiment with everything, but also like continue to get good. You know what I mean? Like that, that's the thing. You got to get good. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, like learning, let's say you spent like a year learning serum, you know, uh, and then you want to learn another synth or you're playing with other stuff at the same time. Continuing to use serum, for example, while you're learning and getting better at it and not falling back in the same loop. Right. Yeah. Which, which makes total sense. I, I think it's just something that's harder for people to, to do than to agree with. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you're on tour right now. You just played a show and you flew in from somewhere yesterday. Uh, and it seems like really in the last couple of years is when like the touring really picked up, right? Oh, and, yeah. and everything started getting crazy. How do you balance, you know, everything we've been talking about uh, now that there's this added component of picking up your life every weekend and flying somewhere and playing these shows? Have you figured out ways to kind of take care of yourself to keep yourself, you know, productive and happy? Oh, that's that? also hard now. <laughs> but like, I mean, you know, it just comes with the, uh, you know, tour life, baby. It's like, it's hard to get used to, and like most people never do get used to it. Sure. But the thing is, is that what's well, a weird thing to do? <laughs> yeah, it's super bizarre. Yeah, <laughs> especially recently, like you know, I've come to the conclusion that if I'm not working, there's no reason for me to be doing this because the thing and what got me into it was making music. You know, mm. that's what I love. I mean, I love playing shows. It's great, but sitting and mentally masturbating over Ableton is like pretty much what I want to do all the time. So like, yeah, I mean like just trying to find time as much time as possible, even when I'm traveling and stuff to like work on music. So you work on the road. I'm really bad at it. Yeah. I'm probably like one of the worst people that work on the road. It's a hard thing to learn. Like there's only specific tasks I can do on the road, you know, simple kinds of arrangements, a anything that's too like brain intensive. I can't make it happen, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> Having to go from being on a plane, traveling, like, you know, barely sleeping and into like one of the most mentally exhausting things that you could do can be a little difficult, but also like Again, I'm a coward, so I could try a little harder. Everyone could, you know. <laughs> do you still feel like a coward? Oh, Even all the time, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, in what way? Like, do, is there some part of what you're doing now that. Oh, here's a good example. To? I mean, like, me and Sullivan King were about to leave the show, and then Designer was there, and I was like, dude, we should definitely take a picture of Designer. And he's yeah. like, yeah. And I was like, I can't. I can't make the introduction. I'm too scared, man. I'm, uh, I, I have stage fright right now. I, I can't do it. And right. He's like, "You are a coward." Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay." So he runs up and he does it for me. So I was like, "All right, sweet." Yeah, yeah. We got the pictures. Cool. Cool. <laughs> right, right, right. That's interesting, man. Because that's another. Even going back to what we started off talking about, like playing a show with a guy like Rusco. Like, yeah. would you be? Would it be weird for you to just have a conversation with him at this point? Uh, well, now no, because I've gotten to meet him, and like, I feel like that's one thing that I love about the dubstep scene is like everyone's so, so, so connected. Most of the people that are in this I've known for years. Yeah. You know? And like a lot of us like came up together and like we're really small artists and like have been talking since like 2014, 2015, something like that. And then like, you know, I go and I meet people that are way more experienced. And then, you know, you have like the Ruscos and stuff that are literally the OGs, like the ones who yeah. coined the genre. Yeah. You know, but th they're all sick. They're really cool. So it's like, it's never been a problem with, for me. Yeah. Well, and I agree with you, man. I think uh, bass music in general, I don't know, maybe it's all scenes in our little world, but, you know, it does end up feeling like an extended family to a Absolutely. certain extent. And, you know, you get these sort of reunions at these festivals. And it's, uh, to me, that's been one of the most rewarding parts of like a career in music is, I was actually just talking about this with somebody where it's, you know, making the music great, playing the shows great, all that. But I don't, I don't know if it'd mean much without like the people around, you know, without the community. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely why I got into it from mm. the beginning. You know, it was the first community that I felt like actually accepted me for you know, me and it's something that I've loved for a long time and like these people really relate to me on like a lot of experiences 
in general and like, you know, what we've had to deal with, like, especially as like a lot of my friends who are artists that have come up in a similar way, you know, not a lot of people can, can really relate with that. Having to really, especially with dubstep, because it's like, you know, dubstep has gone through a lot of ebbs and flows yeah. and stuff where it's like, there is a point in time, like pretty much right when I started making dubstep, when literally everyone hated it, you <laughs> right. know, and like I remember that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there was like this, this is crap music, and you know, a lot of my friends that I started out with, uh, the, everyone had to kind of deal with that. Where like no one was like, especially like people around you were like, why are you making that? Like yeah, it's of, stupid. Of all things, yeah. It's <laughs> like literally like why that's never going to be popular. Like that's like 2010, 2011. Like mm. you know, it's it's not going to work out for you. Did but, that give you pause at the time? Like when you really decided to get serious about that and it was kind of on the downswing, was that was that a concern of yours at the time? Like I liked it. So it, yeah, I didn't saw matter. I I feel like and all my friends too, I think we all kind of saw the potential of the genre and how it could basically turn into for a lot of people this like generation's metal. Yeah. Right. Which it definitely has become. Yeah. So like that's I think that's what we all saw, and you know, despite everyone thinking that it was stupid and it was a dead genre, is like there there were things to make it like even crazier, you know. <laughs> and like I said, a lot of inspirations for especially during that time, like Fizo for sure. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Fizo oh, yeah. was like yeah, yeah, yeah. probably the the person that really put everything together mm. in terms of the music to like make coherently heavy stuff that is listenable to like. A very large audience, you know right? I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean, and it's interesting now. And I mean, we can come back to this later, but you know, I was thinking about sort of the state of of dubstep now in 2019, and it had. I mean, it's changed so much. You know, if you talk about the early like Scream and Benga and Rusko, I mean, sonically, it bears very little resemblance, oh, no. right? And, and now. I, I don't know. Like I feel like it's it's having a moment, right? It's huge. It's blowing up. But I also feel like it, it's kind of become a little stagnant. Maybe just because yeah. it has more attention, and so more people are trying to get in on it. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a ton of to use the classic metal attitude. I'm not like a hater or anything like that. But I mean, like there's a lot of people that. Uh, you know, are posers like they're just getting into the thing for the wrong reasons. You know, mm. they don't like the music; they just think it's po- like it's popping off. So you're gonna hop on it. But that's every EDM tr- uh, trend, right? right? Of course. You know, for in this case, it's heavy dubstep. You know, not not rhythm, blah blah blah. But you know, heavy dubstep. People want to make that stuff because you know they see videos of people mosh pitting and headbanging, and whatever. You know, yeah. And it can work for some people, but it definitely there's a lot of just music coming out, and a lot of it isn't. That good, right? I don't want to gatekeep because, like, there's a ton of new kids that I would love to shout out that are crazy good. And hearing all that stuff is really refreshing to me because sometimes I get in the mode where I'm like, "Oh man, dubstep sounds so stale. Like, what? What's going on?" And like, I I haven't heard anything like super crazy or new. But then it's like a lot of my friends actively push the genre and try to make it cool because, like. That's a very unique thing about it too, because a lot of people, the, small, the smaller artists that are still trying to grow and like get, you know, be, become like big DJs and yeah. stuff, we've ha- all had to put in the work to make a genre that at the time was not popular and was kind of stale from like the serum sample pack days, right? And their serum, serum synth, whatever. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, and make it like super original and super cool and. I have a lot of faith in everyone involved, especially all the new kids, all the people I came up with, into them pushing the genre and as good producers. Like I think that's also the biggest unique thing about dubstep right now is that you had to be like crazy original in order to kind of break through. Right. Which goes back to the problem where it's like it, it gets stale because you have a lunch a bunch of kids that are just gonna make quarter note songs from, you know. Serum packs and stuff like that that just it doesn't sound original, right? But they know that it goes off because they've heard it before. But the thing is that the reason why the the genre got big 
was because of all these producers that were doing original things. Right. Yeah, it's true, man. And it, people forget that I think it's very easy to just sort of see someone else's success and then just try to do what they did, you know, yeah. which is never, it's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's a good way to learn. Like, oh, absolutely. I, I would never discourage people, even from like copying to a certain extent. Whether or not you put out those songs is a different story, but right. like I spend time like trying to figure out how to do things that people do. I mean, that's the whole thing about dubstep too. It's like you hear a cool sound, and you're like, "Damn, I want to make that." You know, right. that's it goes back to the, how do I make the Skrillex bass song or you yeah, know, yeah, the whole yeah. thing? Yeah, exactly, man. But, and, and in doing that, even if you don't end up making whatever that sound is, or even if you do make it and don't release it, you know, I think that's where you learn something that you can use later, right? Mm, like it's absolutely. all these tools you can put in the tool belt. Yeah. And, it's just at the end of the day, you want to, even if you like try to like copy or like try to make someone else's sound or try and copy someone's flow, overall songwriting process, anything, is not to sound like that person not to really, really try and sound original because that's how a song becomes big. That's how right. you know you you learn as an artist. That's how you progress and find your own sound. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think I talk about these ideas a lot. And to me, I think it's hard for people to understand. They're like, well, how do I just be original? You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And and what I always talk about is it's not about you know, doing something nobody else has ever thought of. It's really about just taking an idea and just changing it just a little bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like just yeah. your own little take on it. And sometimes that's all it needs to be, to sound totally different, mm -hmm. you know? Like I I think about your music, which does sound totally unique. And I do think kind of- But any, I mean, it's still not, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, right, that's kind of what I'm saying. There's a lot of influences that I've had, you know, but- um, but like then the, somehow when I hear something you made, I usually can tell like, oh, that's a sudden death song, you know? I don't know if you would attribute that to any one thing, but to me there's like a certain sense of rhythm and syncopation and kind of almost like a bounce in a weird way that, that I hear in a lot of your songs. That's uh, I, Would you agree or is this something I'm totally making up? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that, yeah. <laughs> that, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, like I personally try to make all of my songs like flow really coherently and like be bouncy and be danceable, you know, it's like these heavy sounds, but also like it makes you want, it gives you energy, it makes you want to move and, uh, you know, beat the shit out of your friend. That's like the whole thing, right? <laughs> right, of course. But I think I would even uh, push the compliment one step deeper, which is to say, I think it's more than just energy, like, because uh, if we're still talking about, you know, Scream and Benga and those early guys, back then it was all about the groove, right? Yeah. Like it wasn't so heavy, but it was still crazy bass, mm. just kind of more groovy, I guess is the best way I can think of it. And to me, like exactly what you said, uh, that your music I think is danceable in a way too. Mm. Like it's not only great for, you know, throwing yourself into the pit, but I feel like a lot of it you could actually just dance around to, which I wouldn't say about some dubstep, you know what I mean? Mm. I think that's basically why the whole genre took like such a big turn mm. um, is because, you know, it went through this period after Skrillex basically of, you know, sound design stuff and people trying to, you know, one makes stuff like Skrillex and Skrillex's music is very danceable, very listenable. Yeah. And it became more about like like crazy sounds or just trying to like produce your flex and stuff like that. It became like a kind of a producer's genre yeah. at a certain point. Which is dangerous. Yeah, because like, you know, like that's where it falls off from like the mainstream audience is because you know what is what is big room a lot of, like think about a lot of the big room songs those are just like a kick drum and like a one synth you Literally, know but it's like yeah. a cool flow that's something that's memorable and stuff like that that catches in your brain and y it makes you want to move so what I think happened was the influence of rhythm which was supposed to be very minimal dubstep with like cool sound design right. but um it was all about the flow pretty much uh the influence of that in with like heavy sound heavy sounds and like heavy production like big big kicks big snares and stuff like that yeah yeah i mean it kind of just like made everything go back to the original root of 
the old dubstep, which was like all about groove, the flow, and like you know, like the danceability to it. Because like Roscoe's songs, like it's like head, you know, head bob. Yeah, you know what I mean, it's like this is sick, right? Yeah. But you go a little further, and then it's like serum synth, serum synth, serum synth. You know, right? Yeah. And then you go to like 2000, like 17, 2018 to now, where it's like serum synth, but it, it has like a bit of a bounce or something. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely my favorite kind. Of, I think that's when it's at its best. Do you have this? Is sort of a, a open ended question, but do you have sort of a, a vision or an idea of like where you want it to go? Not necessarily oh, yeah, like time. what's the future, but you know, do you have like what would you like to see happen with dubstep? Uh, ten times more metal. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna get it's gonna get crazy. I think, and my goal is to be able to incorporate all the aspects of what metal used to be in with like this crazy heavy sound design based music. Mm. You know, just pushing it more towards that direction. So. You get more of a live performance. You see something that could be listenable for forever, but it's like, you know, it's still heavy music. I mean, th- think about like all the old thrash bands and stuff. It's yeah. like, re- it's really heavy stuff. It all it has like vocals on it that, you know, people can remember. It's all these catchy riffs that people remember, but it's still crazy heavy. You right. Know? And I think that it's going to start going towards that direction. You thinking about like live instrumentation, that kind of thing? Mm, no, because I think that that is too much for extra thing. Like it depends because yeah. it can be cool sometimes. But I think the true combination to make it like that is purely relying off of vocals, and then also like really cool sound design. But yeah, the vocals are more importantly because that's how you make stuff. More appealing to people on a wider level, right? Because you know people will relate to the vocals. Right? Yeah, and I think uh, that's one way to try to be a little more timeless too, right? Mm-hmm. And not just tied to 2019, yeah. for example. Like you know, you talk about those old classic thrash bands and all that. I mean, you pull out a Slayer album, Metallica album from the 80s. You know, it still sounds just as cool now. Yeah. Right. And I I do feel like, and this isn't specific about dubstep, but just in general. General electronic music runs the risk of being a little more disposable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially with dubstep. Yeah. Because you know, you find a cool sound and then someone wants to do the same thing. And then you know, that's the this new sound you've never heard before. And in a month, then everyone sounds like that. Right. You know, so it's it's very easily disposable. And that's like why it's important to make really really focus on the motifs of the song, focus on melody over Without paying any less attention to, but sound design, you know. Well, yeah, that's interesting you say that because, you know, you're, I think, very good at making uh, the melodic sections of your songs just as much as the sound design parts. But I don't think your average person associates a lot of thought about melody with dubstep, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so talk about that a little bit. You know, if you're sitting down to write a song, do you have kind of an established process? Like, do you, does a melody come first? Does a sound come first? I don't really have a process, but lately it's purely off of, I mean, like, I've, I've been working on, like, all this new music for my Void project, which is, you know, something that I'm going to be doing only, like, Twice this year, and it's and, and that's happening kind of, within like a two day period, right? And, and that's not like a side project, right? But kind of just no. like a different aspect of. It's kind of an extension of my regular project. So, it's sudden death presents void, mm-hmm. right? Basically, the whole thing behind that is trying to make as evil music as I can, pretty much. Okay, within the boundaries of it being. Heavy dubstep. Hmm. But it's like that's where I'm going from right now. When I come in and I'm trying to write a new song, I'm like, how can I make this sound really fucked up? Pretty much. <laughs> so, but the thing is, is that at the beginning, when I sit down and start working on music, I really, really try to avoid having a process of doing it. Oh, that's it's interesting. more just like playing with random stuff and doing random things until I think. I find something that's cool. Like I try to make new drums for every one of my songs. Like normally I'll start out with maybe like a kick and a snare that I have that I can just use. Yeah. So I can bounce off ideas from like just that simple kick snare pattern. Right. Right. That, that's kind of where I go from. Cause like at the end of the day, like the kick and snare is pretty much just a metronome. Right. So 
And then later you can go back and replace the drums or make new ones if you need to. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't know if a lot of people know that, that a lot of producers do just sort of use the same drums on a lot of songs. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's Oh, I I totally reuse a lot of my same drums, but I've also made some really cool ones. So like, it's hard for me to like go and like go into a new project and like make a really good, really good kick drum right off the bat. So it's like, you know, I have a bunch that I've made that I like. Right. At the end of the day, like I try to start out with a new one, new drums every single time. Yeah. But I'd say probably around fifty percent of the time I go back and replace them with old older drums that Sure. Yeah. Well and I think as a song evolves, right? Like you don't always know exactly what drums are gonna work the best when you start it. You know, we're talking about the Void project. I just got the uh the one point five that you Mm -hmm. released and I liked a lot about that. I mean the music on it is great, but I also liked that, you know, there were so many different people like you were talking about you know you want to shout out other people that you think are doing great work and you have a bunch of people on there who made really good stuff oh yeah and i I thought that was great man i don't i don't see that as much anymore in like the 2019 climate of releasing music for someone to put out you know here's eight different remixes by different people i I feel like that's sort of something that's gotten lost a little bit and i personally I, i love that what was the thought process going into that of like like who you want to work with, who you want to get on this project, which, as you said, is sort of like doesn't happen very often, right? Yeah, it was definitely like a like a big process because like at the at the beginning, I definitely had people that I was like, it would be really cool if this person did this remix of this song. I was like in my head, like that that's who I want to do it. And then um, you know, I kind of just like started bouncing ideas off of other my friends and like people like asked me for stems and stuff. And I'm pretty hesitant to give away the majority of. You know my stems and stuff. Right. I mean, like I trust everyone. You know, pretty much that I work with, like all of them. But you know, I'm not. I'm not going to just like throw some random stems at somebody I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, like everyone that released in on the final EP, like those are all like my really close friends who I also believe in. I think they're really talented. And I, mean, I think that's pretty much where it really came from. Is like you know. I gave the stems to people that I trust. Sure. <laughs> I was like, this, you guys will do good stuff with it. Yeah. Lee killed it on that one. Must oh, absolutely. I, that, I think that's probably my favorite remix mm. on there. That's just, he's on a tear right now. Yeah. He's been bouncing back ideas for that one for like since the beginning of this year. Pretty oh, okay. much. And he has a bunch of different versions of them, and all of them were fucking awesome. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me. He's definitely one of the people that really made heavy dubstep like really interesting and like this year he's been off he's been going off he's like I'm going, right, I'm going to show up everybody you know what I mean <laughs> yeah pretty much it's like so. I'm going to make everyone know that yeah, yeah, I talked to him. I, I talked to him on the show, and yeah, he was saying that you know, it, I didn't even realize how long it had been where he was kind of quiet. You know, he has that bright mentality too. It's like you know, when it comes to sound design based music, like it, it's a certain degree of like I'm gonna flex because I'm sick. You know what I mean? And like he right now. He's going for it. Yeah. And he's doing it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think here's maybe a parallel. I think both you and he shared this, which is that you're able to balance a very high level of technicality and still retain a lot of musicality mm-hmm. in it. You know, is that something you consciously think of when Absolutely. you're writing a song? Yeah. yeah. I mean, my biggest thing for writing a song uh, that I think will do well and that I like and has that listenability isn't immediately disposable is writing a melody within the song, making it coherent so it's not just noise. Yeah. I mean, a song can be unique and memorable based off of sound design alone, you know? Right. Because if you really nail it and you make an original sound that no one can make again, and it has a cool flow and it's a cool song, that's that's going to be a memorable song for sure. You yeah. Know, like, there's an, a million instances of that happening. Melody is the easiest way of combining the technical aspects and making it memorable. Well, I mean, a good melody is its own kind of has its own kind of complexity, right? Mm. It's you know I, I, that goes all the way back to you know writing symphonies and that kind of thing, which is if you really get into it, it's like doing math. 
you know? Yeah. You know, obviously the Void Project has given us Behemoth, which I feel like is probably your biggest song to date. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. What, talk about that experience of, you know, now having a, a hit, quote unquote, mm. like, you know, something that people expect to hear every time they see you, something that kind of, you know, changed the the temperature in the room for the whole scene a little bit. Like when you wrote that song, did it feel different to you? Or was it just kind of another cool thing you made? Honestly, uh huh. The yeah, car right, ride? Yeah, Clint's, Clint takes credit for everything. So yeah. yeah <laughs> oh, yeah. so Clint wrote it. Yeah, Clint Clint's wrote your ghost Behemoth. Producer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean like when I made Behemoth, it was just before a show uh, in LA at Palladium that I was like, I want to have some cool shit to play out today because like, that's kind of like how I like to play shows. I want to have something that I've never played out before. Yep. And like it makes me excited about the show. I made that song in a couple hours. And fun fact, the night previous, I was working with my friend Somnium Sound and Yaks. And um, we, we do a thing together. We do 30-minute sessions, that's what we call it. Mm. So we work on one song for 30 minutes. And then close the project and then go to the next song 30 minutes and try oh, to do it like original things like every single time. Right. So Behemoth originally the project file started from, even though it nothing got used from that. Like the synth that goes na 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 that's in the intro. That's not like the right. like the main drop synth. Right. But the the droning intro synth is actually a Somnium sound synth that was from what was supposed to be a collab. Ah. And but like that's the only thing that ended up getting reused. Right. So like that idea started in like ten minutes the night previous, and then I wrote new drums, and then I wrote the entire drop with like a like a delay bass kind mm. of thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It, I wrote that probably within like three or four hours, something like that, and right. I was stoked on it. Did you have a thought of like this is going to be a big song or this could be a big song? Um, huh. Interscope Records. Oh yeah, so yeah, I mean, Clint wants to take credit for uh, everything. <laughs> so here we we can talk about Void if you want to talk about Void. And here we go. All, all, right. Right, all right, so Void was actually a project that was my fuck you to Clint because ah. he didn't like me making rhythm. I just like started uploading random things as like kind of like a dub plate yeah. page on SoundCloud and just like clipping them so that people could hear them when I, they came to my shows because I was going to play them regardless. Mm. And never really released them. So I was doing that for probably like six months or so, and just like putting like every like month or two, putting up like a, a little new ID. Right. People were like, "Who is who is Void? Like who?" That's where a lot of like the hype from the whole album came out from right. first. Because like everyone Cause it was, was like, anonymous to start. Yeah, they're yeah. like, "Is this like Somnium Sound? Is this Subtronics? So like, is it like everyone knew it was me?" But they were like, is it him? Because I never said it was. Mm. Right. So like people were just like assuming or like trying to figure out who it was. Yeah. So me and me and Clint were driving back from Interscope and he was like, let's just release it. And uh we put together like the whole album and EP and Right. So you put it out before you signed anything. Oh, we thought we were gonna sign. Yeah, because we thought right. we were gonna uh, I was gonna sign to Interscope. And so before we wanted to do it, we wanted to have a self-release so we could, you know make streaming money off of whatever thing that we could do smart. with Interscope, Interscope and like get all the money for it <laughs> rather than having to pay a record deal for or record label yeah. for stuff that we could have done prior. Right. So yeah, we just did that and never signed to Interscope. So mm. uh, are you signed to anyone there. right now? No. Uh, yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, it's Which just, is uh, Slail. You're right. Yeah, slow, yeah. yeah. I mean, because a lot of what you've done recently has been self released, right? Or am I wrong about that? Yeah. I've done remixes for some people. I really haven't released that much music this year. Yeah. Because I've kind of kept it like more to myself and just from my live sets. But yeah, I mean, like this year I did a song with Marshmallow at the beginning and then one single, then remix for Space Laces. Uh, I had a single the week before. I put out Void, so it's t- kind of part of the album. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, I just put out my EP yesterday. Yeah, man. Well, that's got to feel good, too. Mm. It's uh, number one, as we talked about earlier. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> does that, I mean, how, how does that affect you? Like, is that, do you pay attention to, I know Clint does, but do you pay attention to, you know, the the number ones, where you sort of are in the rankings of everything? Is that something that's on your radar? 
I mean, it's extremely validating like to hear and see that kind of stuff. Um, it makes me think that I'm actually doing something. <laughs> right. I mean, like at the end of the day, I, I, I don't really care. Like, I, I like the people fuck with my music. Like, that's really important to me. You know, I want to make music that people can like and yeah. listen to and dance to. And, but I mean, like at the end of the day, I just, I, you know, I still make it for myself. Right. And um, we talked about you getting into it kind of when it wasn't as popular. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, is, I don't think that anybody knew it was going to, you know, blow up to be like playing at festivals and stuff like that. You know, mm. I never expected that. Oh, Clint knew. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, cl- of course. But, I mean, Clint, Clint did knew. believe in me in the yeah. beginning. That's why he picked me up. So how did you guys meet? How did that happen? I met Clint at a house party. It, like my friends showed him my stuff and then Clint was like, yeah, got to pick this guy up. Yeah. So right. Getter showed him my stuff. Were you at the point, were you looking for management? I wanted to get us a little. That yeah. was my main goal. Okay. Yeah. So I finessed, that whole thing. Right. It was, it was my idea. <laughs> it was all your plan, yeah. <laughs> that, but for real, like that was like where I was looking for for management and um I wasn't really gonna do anything else. So, mm, yeah. so it all just kind of came together yeah. the the way you hoped. Yeah. Which because I, I had a bunch of offers and stuff at mm. that point. Mm. What was it about them that was different to you that was really appealing? I mean, Clint has a really great brand. He's bald. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We should Calling mention it. that again. Clint's yeah, yeah. bald. Right, uh, do you guys remember when I said Clint was bald? <laughs> it was really funny. Yeah. But uh, I mean, let's talk a little bit before we get out of here about you know those early days and when you were just starting to you know before you even had like one song that people really knew. When did you move to LA? I moved to LA in January first of two thousand sixteen. And did you move there for music? I mean, I moved there because I like I didn't hate my life because you know like you know I live with my parents, so it was cool. Like I love my parents; they're great. Yeah. But also, I didn't want to be living with my parents forever, and like I, you know, I was just like doing like kind of dead end jobs, and like I really wasn't progressing anywhere in my life in general. Mm. Like I was trying to do school. I went to like community college and stuff. I was trying to learn programming, and stuff. but what I wanted to do was do music. And my friend Samim Sound, he just signed up for Icon, the, the music school in yep. LA. He's like, I'm moving to LA. And he's like, my best friend. So I was like, and my girlfriend at the time, she lived there. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to move to LA. Moved in with her. And once you got to LA, like, what was that like until, you know, until you really started to break out? Were you just making music all the time? Were you, you know, meeting well, people? How did that work? I mean, I kind of just like found, because like I was already involved in the dubstep scene and the, like on the underground and the, on the internet, I hadn't right. really ever met too many people in real life. You know, I, I had a bunch of friends that were involved in the dubstep scene in the Bay Area where I, I grew up, and you know, we would go to all these dubstep shows. And back then, we were like, we're gonna mosh this music, and like right. everyone hated it, and we always <laughs> get kicked out of clubs and stuff. <laughs> but um, I met some people that I was like talking to on the internet for a while, like um, like my friends like Al Ross and Yaks, and like sort of hanging out with them all the time, and got introduced to you know like rhythm and like you know like chopping music and like you know chopping and CDJs. Right. Yeah. I mean that that was like the biggest influence, and like the whole LA scene was crazy back then. Like it was it, it was all these small clubs pretty much like that we were all just going to like everyone involved in the dubstep scene right. back then. We just go to these like really shitty clubs and you kind of see the same people everywhere. Yeah, it's like every week we probably just all meet up and like hang and, and listen to dubstep. And during the week we just like chop rhythm on CDJs. <laughs> I mean, when do you feel like you kind of made a turn with your production? Because you mentioned earlier that for a while, you know, you look back and you think, ah, that wasn't so good. But mm. w- was there any kind of like light bulb moment when you really started to sort of feel confident in what you were doing? Before I made Dubstep, I had a bunch of different aliases, and then when I made started making Dubstep, I made the alias Sudden Death, and I was like, "This is what I want to do." Mm. Um, and that's because I was listening to people like Fizo and Samplifier, Uber, like these people that are making like really heavy stuff. That I was like, "Damn, this is metal, right?" Yeah. But it's electronic music. That that was cool, but I wasn't really ever good, and I don't think I really had too unique of a sound but there's a lot of people that believed in me I think at that point because like I think that me as a producer I was good and so like my mix sounds were really good and I was making interesting sounds but I met my friend Ula Sile and he taught me a lot especially about mix sounds and pretty much doing and experimenting with whatever yeah to make stuff cool and he was like a very very big influence for the whole underground dubstep scene because he c- kind of coined this style of mix down that was like just slam 
everything and make it really loud because right. the loud songs are going to stand out. Right. You know, compared to a lot of mix sounds uh, for dubstep that were lo- um, less polished and sure. uh, quieter. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, it became, there was like a, a loudness war, a mild loudness oh, war. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I lament that sometimes because there's times when I want to go back to older dubstep songs, but it's really hard to play them next to new yeah. dubstep songs. You know what I mean? Mm. But I mean, you can you can still figure out a way to get those that kind of dynamic out of music and it still be really loud. Like, I think that's one of the things that we've learned a lot through. The, the style of mixing, I think that Ul Sile kind of coined mm. um, that people don't really know that he was the one who kind of pushed the loudness envelope. Mm. Yeah, in, in my opinion, he was the one who really like solidified it. But I think the moment in my career, once I moved to LA, like once I decided, I kind of figured out what direction I was going. Was I mean, like I was always listening to rhythm, and then like once I started getting really involved in the rhythm scene and meeting all these other producers that you know at that time were classified as rhythm artists. Right. Like I started taking influence from that. And then my friend Murda, he made a side alias called Tug, which was really heavy sound design with rhythm flow, which is kind of what Pfizer was doing. Like kind of like simplified flow uh, that was like really coherent. Right. But with like crazy sounds. But once Murda did that, I was like, I want to try doing stuff like that. And um, me and my friend Song and Sound made what we were gonna do as a side project originally, which was us doing like a rhythm right. side project with that same kind of idea. Ended up we made like our song Marauders, and then I started pretty much building everything off of that mm. kind of. Well, that's cool, man. I like I, I like that it kind of just came out of that community, and you mm-hmm. know that inspiration just came from your friends and the people around you. So I think that's how all the best ideas get started. You know, is not so much a, a grand concept, but just kind of something you and your friends are excited about. Yeah, it's, definitely. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too. Like I think about you know other types of inspiration, and you know you've mentioned a lot of times that. Uh, dubstep, you know, what you want it to make people do is to jump around, you know, to like energize people, get in the mosh pit, whatever it is. Because I I wonder sometimes about, you know, people say like, I wrote this song when I was really angry or, you know, this song helped me deal with whatever. Is that something that you would apply to your music too? Like, does it actually help you work through stuff in in your own life? I'd say it's therapeutic, but also it's kind of circular because sometimes making very sound design heavy music is like yeah. is also enraging on its own <laughs> you know yeah very frustrating but i mean you know i i consider my music to be very emotional like like a lot of it comes from me being i'm not like in general like an angry person but you know like you know anxiety like for sure mm. and i hate clint right and nice. Yeah, I'm going to fight him probably <laughs> later. But, you know, like it's very emotional music taken from a lot of really negative emotions, mm. not anything really happy, yeah. but just channeling a lot of my anger and anxiety and stuff and so making this like, you know, something that Yeah, yeah. it feels like a fist. Oh yeah, I, I feel you, fisting. <laughs> not literally, but yeah. You're right. <laughs> not that, not that part. Yeah, not till we turn the cameras off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, I totally relate to that. I mean, mm. for me as a kid, like actual metal music was absolutely that for me. Mm. Have you figured out ways cuz I I'm an introverted person. I'm a fairly anxious person from time to time. Time. Have you found ways to deal with that in and still be like a headlining artist, you know, a professional person with fans and all of that, which brings its own kind of anxieties and pressures? Mm. Do you feel that? And have you found ways to kind of still take care of yourself while everything gets bigger and crazier around you? Yes and no. I feel like there's ways that I've gotten better about dealing with it. It gets hard at the end, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's just all about like kind of improving every little aspect of your life mm. and trying to mend those things rather than fully deal with every other problem, especially maybe your biggest ones. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, Deal with the small ones first. Yeah, and kind I th- of figure it out. One foot in front of the other, right? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's honestly actually good advice for anyone trying to work through something. Is you can't tackle it all at once. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard looking at a problem in the face and being like, "Damn, how the hell do I not be an anxious, emotional wreck all the time?" 
Right. right. But then, you know, you, you have to work on the small things. First. Yeah, sure. You know, and, and instead of doing that, it's almost like what we were talking about earlier with production. It's like, how do I just be original? You mm-hmm. know, it's like those big concepts, I think we can't really understand. But if we're talking about how do I become less of an anxious wreck? Well, you know, uh, maybe eat better, you know, or maybe yeah. go to the gym sometimes or whatever it is, like whatever may, a little thing that makes you feel better, you tie a couple of those together and then six months down the road, maybe you feel better a little. I don't mm. know. <laughs> is, yeah. there, is there anything you've found lately? That oh, drinking 24 White Claws a day. Oh, okay. Yeah, that seems like a that great idea. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like the, the things that have really like changed in my life significantly, I think, uh, I don't know, it sounds kind of whack, but I mean, like I just started dating a girl who's really cool. And like, I think that was a big aspect of my life that was like kind of fucked up for a bit. Mm. So yeah, just like that, that helped me a some lot. Some bad relationships, that but, kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, what I'm trying to tell you is that your emotional stability should com- be, completely be dependent on another person. <laughs> right, exactly. That's my whole advice right there. Yeah. <laughs> but no, man, that's beautiful. That's not corny at all, man. That's uh, finding someone who you can kind of experience this weird life with. I think that there's almost nothing more valuable than that. Definitely. Before we get out of here, is there anything we haven't talked about? Anything else that's on your mind? Anything you want to get out there? I'm playing probably the most important show of this year besides like EDC. It's going to be a two day thing at the Ogden in Denver. Mm. The first day is me, Sudden Death, and it's going to be really cool because it's, it's like a lot of what I do normally, but also like trying to make it as extra as possible. And then playing my first Void set of the whole year, nice. which I'm really trying to bring out the demons <laughs> and uh, make it really, really weird. Last question, just looking for a time in your life when in a moment music really deeply affected you kind of meant to be a broad question you can interpret it as you want just the first thing that pops into your head well i mean it sounds corny but literally music is my life so i think it's affected me very deeply on every aspect all the time um when it comes to like hearing a certain song uh or like seeing a certain show i mean i kind of just can point back to you know the first show that i went to or the first electronic music show that i went to like the first like what I've been was to, the first electronic music show you went to? Um, well, the first I went to like some underground raves, like a bunch of them, when I was a lot younger, and I was a little candy kid. But the first like actual concert I went to that was like I paid to go to the show was um, Excision oh. and Downlink and Anti Serum, mm. and that was when I was eighteen years old. Or not like first concert I ever paid to go to, but first one that was electronic music because right. back then you couldn't really go to any big shows that were like all ages, especially in the Bay Area. They didn't really have those. The ones you could go to were the warehouse parties. That <laughs> right. It was some burnt ass forty five year old trying to basically <laughs> hit on sixteen year old girls and stuff playing. And, yeah, yeah, I've seen a few. Gross. Of those. <laughs> what do you remember about that that night, the Excision show? It was the first time I heard crazy dubstep being played on like a really good sound system. And That's it huge. was like, it immediately like made me feel like in my body, I was like, this is sick you know right well and that's the, those are great moments because that's when you hear something the way it's intended to be heard right mm-hmm. and at least for me then that unlocks something in my brain of like oh like i know what this is for now like now i kind of know what i need to do right mm-hmm. yeah definitely i mean i've i've been to so many shows and like seen so many of my favorite artists play and it's like it, to me like that is what i'm doing you know that's that's my life so like yeah music affects me on a very, very regular basis that inspires me or makes me mad or insecure about my own music <laughs> career or, <laughs> right. you know, like makes, you know, really makes me want to do more interesting stuff, inspires me. Yeah, man, no, 100%. I mean, I think that's, we're all here because of that, right? Mm-hmm. It's, there's something about that that in, connects with our brains differently than other people. Yeah. Well, this has been great, man. Uh, thanks for doing it. This yeah, is a fun of course. chat. Yeah, it was awesome. Peace. Yeet. Right, that's the show. Shout out to Sudden Death. 
That was really fun, man. Great to talk to you. For everybody out there listening, don't forget Void 1.5, the remix EP just dropped. There's a couple new tracks from Sudden Death as well. He's on tour right now and kind of all the time. Hit the link in the description of this episode where you can go keep up with him and grab all the new music. My name is Willie Joy. You can keep up with me too at Back to Back Pod or at Willie Joy on all social media, or you can hit me up back to back pod at gmail.com. Don't be shy. That's it for this week's episode. I'm heading off to LA in a few days. Going to be out there for a week and some change, getting in some studio time and also recording a ton more episodes for you. I've got some good ones planned. I hope you have a good week. I hope you feel good. I hope you get to get outside, enjoy the last of the late summer while it's here. And most importantly, as always, take care of yourself. Take care of the people around you, and I will talk to you next week. For Back to Back, this is Willie Joy. Peace.